uh, develop uh, anesthesia for cancer patient and all the complications that may occur after uh, in patient with uh, cancer and uh, all the systemic uh, problems that may be induced by chemotherapy and all the complications we might uh, have for all the cancer patients. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this introduction. And I'm really honored today to be presenting among you and to be representing the Lebanese medical diaspora all over the world and to be connecting to the roots again. Thank you for the organizing committee for this opportunity. Thank you for all my previous professors that recommended me for this presentation. So currently I'm working in Paris at Gustave Roussy. It's an oncology center. And that's why I will be uh, discussing with you for the coming 20 minutes, uh, anesthesia challenges in cancer patients. So I have no conflict of interest to declare. And as you see in the picture, we will have a, a very focus on what an anesthesiologist can face when he is caring about cancer patients. So to start, cancer is a leading problem worldwide with increasing incidence and with increasing mortality. It's becoming a global burden all over the world. More and more patients now during the course of their disease are, will need at least once in their course of disease, a surgical intervention. It can be diagnostic, it can be therapeutic. In all cases, it will need an anesthesia intervention. Oncology therapy is unique. It requires a multidisciplinary team. And on board, we have surgeons, we have medical and radiation oncologists, we have palliative medicine specialists, and we have also us anesthesiologists. The main cancer treatment, as you all know, we have chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery, the three of which will have different side effects on the human body. And an anesthesiologist caring for cancer patient will be required to know the long-term and the acute side effects of these, uh, uh, side, uh, the side effect of these treatments in order to have a quite clear plan of care of those patients throughout the perioperative phase. Also, anesthesiologists will have a very important role in the analgesic management of those patients for the acute and for the uh, chronic pain. So cancer treatment, we will detail them a bit together. For the chemotherapy, chemotherapy can be neoadjuvant, it can be adjuvant and palliative, neoadjuvant being before the surgery. Most of the chemotherapy drugs, as we all know, are anti-proliferative agents, so they will be uh, working and targeting the rapidly dividing cells. Unfortunately, in our body, we have non-malignant rapidly dividing cells, and those drugs will target also those non-malignant cells, and that's where the toxicity of the drugs will appear. And the toxicity can hit all the system. Uh, the thing is, with chemotherapy, usually we have protocols combining many drugs, so we will also have a combination of all the side effects. In the literature, you can find charts with all the medication, the chemotherapy medication with their principal uh, toxicity. I will just overview rapidly with you. For the respiratory uh, system, we have mainly a concern with pulmonary fibrosis. On the cardiovascular system, it can, the toxicity can range from arrhythmias onto cardiac failure. In the renal system, it's mainly the renal impairment. On the hepatic system, it will be disorders in the coagulation system. For the nervous system, it's peripheral neuropathy with concerns when we have regional anesthesia to perform. And for the bone marrow, it's the overall myelosuppression. The radiotherapy, it's the uh, second uh, cancer treatment, which is frequently used with chemotherapy. It causes tissue damage and fibrosis, which will lead us to delayed wound healing, induration of the skin and vascular stenosis and other complications. An anesthesiologist that will take care of a cancer patient with head and neck cancer, he will have some important challenges to face. 
those patients most of the time have radiotherapy prior to their surgery. So we will have a concern with difficult central venous access because of the fibrosis and the skin injuries. Most of them with cervical radiotherapy will have an impairment of the barrel reflex sensitivity. And so during the operation, we will have a hemodynamic mobility all over with the general anesthesia with a lot of episodes of bradycardia, hypertension, that will be a challenge for the anesthesiologist to stabilize throughout the surgery. And the very main concern will be the airway management of these patients, and specifically for two reasons. First, it's the site and the size of the tumor. And second, as we discussed, when we have radiotherapy, so the, there will be rigidity, fibrosis, and we will have limited neck extension, as we see in the picture, we will have rigidity of the oropharyngeal tissue, and that will expose us to a difficult ventilation scenario with a difficult laryngoscopy and intubation scenario. So anesthesiologists should be very well aware of this risk and very well prepared for it. Second, most of the time, those head and neck cancer patients will need re-intervention later on. It can be in the acute phase for a complication of the surgery, or long-term for functional optimization or aesthetical optimization. And we will be facing, again, a difficult intubation scenario with a difficult ventilation scenario. And most of those patients will need awake intubation. Third cancer treatment will be the surgery. And I've, I've, as I've previously said, most of those patients during their course of their disease will need at least one intervention. It can be for a preventive or diagnostic purpose. It could be for a staging, a debulking purpose, a supportive or a palliative purpose. In all cases, they will need an anesthesia. So anesthesiologists caring for those cancer patients, after all this overview, you see that there are many challenges and this will dictate for the anesthesiologist all the perioperative uh, preparation for those patients. And we will detail together the, each phase alone. Starting by the preoperative assessment. You see that frailty is not uncommon among cancer patients, and so it should be screened on a routine basis. Most of those patients will need prehabilitation before their surgery. First of all, they can be undernourished because they are not eating well, because it's the cancer, because they, are, they have head and neck cancers, and so they cannot really have good access to food. They need physiotherapy on a respiratory basis and for their motor function. In head and neck uh, cancer patients, we have a specific concern with alcohol, smoke, and other uh, drug toxicity. So they should be screened and they should be uh, followed and very well prepared in order to stop all those toxics before the surgery. As we've seen with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we have to uh, detect what drugs have been given before in this neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy in order to have a thorough evaluation about the cardiac, the pulmonary, and the renal functions of the patient and to optimize it if needed, not to forget the airway assessment in this preoperative phase. And so the plan for the following phases of anesthesia will be done in a multidisciplinary uh, way, specifically if those patients had neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So there must be a discussion with oncologists and surgeons in order to find the best interval for the surgery in the course of the disease. And from this phase, from this preoperative phase, the anesthesiologist will build and structure his intraoperative and postoperative management plan. So for the intraoperative management plan, he will decide for the anesthesia technique that should be used, the anesthesia drugs to be used, the anesthesia monitoring, specifically if we need like an arterial line, central line, a cardiac output monitoring for the airway management, antibiotic prophylaxis, 
analgesia strategy and transfusion preparation if there's a, a surgery with a big risk of bleeding. And then he will also be prepared for his post-operative phase with two main concerns. We should be sorting which patients will need an ICU observation based on their comorbidities, based on the surgical intervention. And the second very important concern is the pain management. I will be just talking about the acute postoperative pain management. So these patients can be very challenging in treating their postoperative pain. First, they can have preoperative pain because of a growing tumor, because of neuropathic pain. So they are already under opioid uh, uh, medication and other pain medication, which will develop and they will be developing opioid tolerance. Sometimes because of their chemotherapies, because of other comorbidities, they have contraindication to non-opioid analgesics. They have contraindication to regional anesthesia because of coagulation problem. And so we are facing a very challenging situation where we have really to personalize the pain management technique for those patients. And we all know that an inadequate post-operative pain treatment can lead to many complications. So adding to those pharmacological pain management techniques, we have the interventional pain uh, management techniques that are very useful in this case. We have the peripheral nerve blocks with or without catheter insertion and the neuroaxial analgesia. And as you all know, both of them should be uh, started at the induction of anesthesia because we would be benefiting from their anti-inflammatory uh, benefits throughout the surgery and in the post-operative phase. Other challenges for the uh, anesthesiologist dealing with cancer patients is the need of anesthesia outside the OR. And I can assure you it's a growing challenge because all the um, cancer treatments, there are lots of innovations, and our, there are lots of interventions that should be done outside our comfort zone that is our OR. We have lots of new diagnostic procedures. We have MRIs, scanners, the follow-up procedure, mainly for the pediatric uh, population. We have new therapies with the radiation that are outside the OR, brachytherapy, lots of new innovations in interventional radiology that need anesthesia, so in a new setting. The challenges in this is the organization for this new activity that should be done. So as I've said, outside our comfort zone with a specific planning for each procedure, a specific setting and equipment for each procedure, uh, a specific site. There are specific monitoring because we have specific patients that are eligible for these interventions. The post-operative care also is personalized for the types of intervention and the types of patients. In those settings, the anesthesiologist, the, the equipment of anesthesia between ventilators, scopes, they are they have um, like um, an organized setting. We don't have access easily to the patient, and we also have to be protecting ourselves from the radiation. So this is a new challenge also for all anesthesiologists dealing with those patients. And a new um, booming uh, subject currently, it's the link between anesthesia and cancer outcomes, which I will be discussing quickly with you. Uh, we have many studies that show there, that propose a link between those two topics. They suggested that all the anesthetics we use very operatively, the analgesics, the drugs, the anesthesia technique, could affect the post-operative inflammation in the patient and the immune function of the patient. And therefore, it could lead to cancer metastasis and to disease recurrence. And so since the cancer patient, we will be exposed to general anesthesia, Sometimes it's several exposures. Sometimes it's a lengthy exposure. It's always complex. 
its various modalities of anesthesia, that's an important question to be uh, thought about. And therefore, throughout the literature, you can find lots of studies around the subject. There are in vitro studies, in vivo studies, animal studies. And recently, there are many randomized controlled trials about the subject. Since we don't have a lot of time, I won't be going into detail, but all the studies are really discussing the opioid effects, the total intravenous anesthesia, volatile anesthesia, so the different techniques and the different drugs of anesthesia and their effects on cancer. At this stage, what I could say is that we have lots of research, but the data is still insufficient to have a form of definitive recommendation on what is the best anesthetic choice for cancer patients. And that's because of a lot of patient genetic heterogeneity and because the oncologic disease, the, the biology of the tumor cells is really vast and complex. We have different types of cancer cells, different subtypes of cancer. So really having a match between the best anesthesia and the best cancer, the best cancer patient is not that easy. We know that many studies are ongoing and um, slowly they will be paving the way to uncover the safest anesthesia for oncology patients. But what's good with this growing interest on the perioperative intervention and all those studies is that it led to the birth of a new subspecialty in the anesthesia field, it's the onco-anesthesia. That's a very interesting uh, innovation, if you can say, because more and more anesthesiologists caring for oncology patients will be gathering around experiences, around expertise, around recommendations for these patients. And they will follow out all the innovations in order to reach at certain points, maybe, we hope for that, the best anesthesia and the safest anesthesia technique for such patients. And so I will be concluding with you with some take home messages. As you've seen throughout the presentation, cancer is really a leading health problem worldwide. The approach to cancer patients is and should still be always multidisciplinary. Cancer treatments are evolving and improving. And anesthesiologists dealing with such patients must follow this innovation, must follow the cancer uh, possibilities and treatments, and specifically their side effects, their harmful side effects on the patient. Those anesthesiologists must start by, have many challenges in, in, in fact to face throughout the perioperative circuit of their patients. They have to start with a very thorough preoperative assessment to identify the treatment, the side effects of those treatments, the side effects of the disease itself on their patients in order to well prepare them, to optimize them before their surgery and to have a very well structured plan for the intraoperative management and the postoperative management, mainly the pain management. And with the new onco-anesthetic medicine starting, I guess we have lots of future for this specialty and for the anesthesiologists working with those patients. I thank you for your attention. This is exactly where I work and thank you all of you. Good morning. Uh, today, I, it's my pleasure to present Dr. Rani Shahal. Dr. Rani is a clinical and research staff uh, initiative at the Peter McCallum Cancer Center in Melbourne, as well as uh, a senior uh, clinical lecturer at the 
Center of, uh, for Integrative Health Care in the University of Melbourne, uh, Australia. Uh, Dr. Rani uh, has a strong interest in the perioperative uh, medicine and quality improvement. Uh, and now uh, he's the current uh, lead uh, for the quality officer and airway uh, at the Department of Cancer, Anesthesia and Perioperative Medicine. He had multiple uh, researchers and uh, was awarded uh, multiple uh, awards with the last but not the least from the Australian and New Zealand College of Anesthetists, the Gilbert Brown Prize for his work on surgical thrombolysis prevention. Uh, Dr. Rani, the floor is yours. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to address this subject in the next 20 minutes, and I will explain what RIVE is in the second half of the talk, so stay tuned. Now, this is the current state of play. Unfortunately, one of three of us in this room will be diagnosed with cancer at some point during their lifetime, and it's one in two if you include skin cancers. And unfortunately, one in four of these patients will actually die from their cancer diagnosis, but the cause of death is not really the primary tumour. It's actually recurrence and metastases. Now, we know that we are in the middle of a cancer epidemic, so the World Health Organization approximated over 15 million new cancer diagnoses in 2015, and that's expected to explode to over 22 million by 2030. Now, you might say that's staggering, but really, I'm an anaesthetist, I'm not an oncologist, not really going to impact my practice. But the reality really is that over 60% of these patients would require surgery and an anaesthetic uh, intervention during, uh, for, their, for their cancer treatment. And also over 80% of these patients require anesthetic support during the cancer journey. So we really need to get this onto anesthesia right. Now also, unfortunately, we are still emerging from the crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's been estimated that uh, this would lead to over 1,700 new uh, additional deaths from colorectal cancer in Australia alone between 2020 and 2044. And that's due to interruption of screening services, diagnostic and treatment services as well. And it's also been estimated that the pandemic has delayed breakthroughs in cancer research by over 18 months. Now we'll talk a little bit about can cancer pathophysiology just to help explain uh, some of the concepts in this talk. So as you all know, solid tumors consist of two compartments, the parenchyma, which contains amniplastic cells, and also the stroma, which is needed really to uh, for tumors to grow to more than two millimeters. So this is really is the supporting microenvironment for these uh, tumors. And it contains things like proteins and proteoglycan, but also our immune cells, which police this microenvironment. Now, as you recall, our immune system consists of both our innate immunity, which is a rapid response uh, system, and it can include things such as barriers like skin, but also cells like granulocytes, macrophages, mast cells that coordinate our immune response, but also these important cancer-fighting natural killer T cells. And also our adaptive immunity, which is a slow but targeted response, and include two, two cell lines, the B cells or blood cells that pr produce antibodies, and also our T cells which differentiate into CD8 cytotoxic T cells, and also our CD4 cells, which further really differentiate into T helper one, and it's really important immunosuppressive T regulatory cells that we'll talk about in a second. Now, unfortunately, our immune system is our friend and our foe in the fight against cancer. So tumors, when their tumors initially develop, they express tumor-specific antigen onto their surface, uh, and the uh, immune system recognizes these as foreign and mounts an elimination response. But really, tumors are quite heterogeneous. Uh, quite heterogeneous. There's cells that are less immunogenic than others, and they manage to survive this elimination attack. And then our immune system really holds us in the state of equilibrium um, for a period of time. But then uh, eventually, an escape mechanism occurs where, when there is a change in a patient, such as stress, uh, ex exposure to additional toxins, or having surgery. And there's a transformation in the cytokines in the tumor microenvironment and differentiation of the CD4 cells into these immunosuppressive T regulatory cells that result in an escape of these cancer cells and then tumor dissemination. And this is really the same cytokine genetic signature that we see with wound healing after surgery. Now, after tumors enter the circulation, they actually, the circulation is quite a hostile environment, but they actually cloak themselves in platelet to evade our immune system and also activate this circulinase pathway in the endothelium to allow endothelial leak and seeding of distant metastases. Now, we'll talk a little bit about perioperative vulnerability and surgery and cancer recurrence. Now, we know that surgery remains the foremost treatment strategy for solid tumors. But the paradox really that over one third of patients will have a post-operative disease recurrence and sometimes quite early. And that's uh, even despite having local regional disease control. 
And we know that surgery induces a physiological fight or flight response, and this activates a number of signaling pathways, including neuroendocrine, inflammatory, immunological, and uh, hemostatic. And all of these really can contribute to tumor progression, cancer recurrence, and progression of metastatic disease. And we've known this really for over 2,000 years, so surgeons were able to remove breast cancers back 2,000 years ago without any anesthetic. And they even wrote back then that the more violent the operation, the more angry that these tumors grew. Now, Jonathan Hiller published a nice summary in Nature in 2017 that highlighted the perioperative vulnerability that occurs through local tissue injury and how certain tumors uh, promoting factors and modulators of perioperative stress like pain, anxiety, hypothermia, and blood product transfusion can actually increase the risk of cancer recurrence and metastasis at the time of surgery. Now, Eric Sloan in her lab looked at the impact of stress on cancer in, in mice models. So these are uh, mice that had the primary breast cancers. And it was stressed for uh, 28 days. And stress itself resulted in a significant in increase in distant metastasis in this mice model. But when these mice were given propanol or a non-selected beta uh, blocker, then actually there was a significant reduction in metastatic load. But when we were given a beta agonist, then again, there was an increase in distant metastases. Now, Zoo looked at the impact of neuroendocrine stress response and catechoid means on our immune system. And again, they showed that there was an increase uh, concentrate, with increasing concentration with adrenaline, there was an increase in expression of these immunosuppressive T regulatory cells that we spoke about. And this was again attenuated when propanolol was given to these patients. And this really makes sense because we know that uh, beta adrenal receptors are expressed not only on our immune system, but also on, on our tumor cells as well. And these are G protein couple receptors that activate a number of signaling of uh, cyclic AMP pathways and signaling pathways and result in expressions of genes that promote inflammation, angiogenesis, uh, tumor uh, invasion, and also impairment of our immune uh, cellular response. And we also know that inflammation is also a key component of tumor recurrence. And Barbenda also showed that increased COX-2 expression in non-small cell lung cancers is associated with a decreased Farvey survival that was significant. And again, this makes sense because we know that prostaglandin E2 produced by tumor cells can cause upregulation of these immunosuppressive T regulatory cells and inhibition of our cytotoxic T cells, and also a change in the uh, cytokine pro profile in patients. Now, this is a mouse that has cancer that had uh, underwent the laparoscopic procedure. And again, we can see that the uh, tumors really love inflammation. So the initial site of metastasis is actually around the port sites. But also when the peritoneum was damaged in these patients, the tumor then had significant transcellomic metastases to the site of inflammation where the damage occurred. So we're gonna really say that cancer hijacks are normal wound healing pathways. But the fundamental difference really is that tumors do not engage a self-limiting me mechanisms. And that's what really led to, uh, Harold Borak, who discovered our vascular and mycelial growth growth factor, uh, to say that uh, tumors are wounds that do not heal. And we know that the genetic damage is the match that lights the fire of cancer, but it's really immunosuppression and inflammation are the fuels that feed these flames. And although it's always nice to blame uh, surgeons uh, for everything and anything that goes wrong with our anesthetics, unfortunately, really, anesthesia might also contribute to cancer progression. So in 2016, it was the 10th year anniversary of this landmark publication by Exodactylos, Donald Buggy, and Dan Sessler. They looked at cancer outcomes in probable breast cancer uh, uh, patients that are having a mastectomy. Uh, they gave them and provided them with a paraverbal catheter for 48 hours. Uh, and this was again a retrospective study with a single center and 129 patients. And they found that there was a fourfold reduction, reduction in cancer recurrence or metastases in the paravertebral uh, group that was significant. And this really spawned the whole field of research. And the hypothesis was that the anesthetic and analgesic technique can contribute to long-term cancer outcomes. And we really wanted to evaluate a biologically plausible mechanism by which this can occur. So we know really that we can inhibit the sympathetic signaling uh, during the anesthetic by either providing beta adrenal receptor blockades or providing a neuraxial block. So Shashwa and Bernal Yahu undertook a multi-center randomized biomarker trial that was double-blinded, placebo-controlled. Uh, in early stage female breast cancer uh, patients undergoing a mastectomy. They provided patients with 11 continuous days of treatment, so five days of propanolol and a COX-2 inhibitor pre-op, an increased dose of propanolol on the day of the surgery, and then five days of propanolol and etodolac again after surgery. And this resulted, you know, this combination therapy really resulted in a significant reduction in pro-inflammatory cytokines and CRP levels uh, after surgery. 
And also there was significant reduction in expression of genes involved in, in, in promotion of metastases or promote recruitment of myeloid cell types and epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Now, Paul Miles used Zyda from the master trial looking at cancer outcomes with epidural, uh, with thoracic epidural use uh, in patients having major open abdominal cancer surgery. This was quite a heterogeneous group, but majority were colorectal cancer, and it was powered to a one third treatment effect with an up to 15 year follow up. And they found there was no difference in recurrence free survival uh, in patients that received an epidural. Cummings, on the other hand, again looked at cancer outcomes with thoracic epidural use in non metastatic colorectal adenocarcinomas. This was a large retrospective analysis using the SEAS database in America. Uh, again, uh, so using administrative data sets with a five year follow up. And they found that the epidural group actually lived 1.5 years longer, had a, a longer overall survival. Uh, Jonathan Hiller and Bernard Riedel also looked at uh, outcomes with the Ivor Lewis surgery for esophageal cancer at a single center uh, in the UK. Uh, and they by using and they did that by using again uh, thoracic epidurals and they described them as effective epidurals if they were left in situ for at least 36 hours without any opiate supplementation. And having an effective epidural will have resulted in a delayed cancer recurrence of two years that was significant. And the effective epidural group actually lived 1.1 years longer. So the summary really is that a lot of the negative studies uh, out there have not really talk, uh, did not describe the local anesthetic type or concentration and dose that was used. Um, and this is really important because we know that high volume blocks cause systemic local uh, anesthetic absorption, which actually might cause an effect on cancer progression. And the trials again were a comparison of combined uh, epidurals and GAs and a GA, and not really epidurals alone versus uh, GAs alone. Now, in terms of our hypnotic anesthetic agents, we know that volatiles and, and propofol have distinct influences on inflammation and in cell phenotypes and cancer progression. So volatiles obviously act on GABA receptors, but they also act on a number of other receptors that can result in a reduction in our neutrophil, neutrophil numbers, uh, reduction in natural killer cell cytotoxicity, and increasing in pro-tumorogenic pro pro uh, cytokines. Whereas propofol seems to preserve our natural killer cell cytotoxicity and increase natural killer cell infiltration into tumors. Now, Tim Wickmore undertook a large uh, retrospective analysis uh, between 2020 and 2013 in over 7,000 patients in all cancer surgery. And they found that again, uh, for when propofol maintenance uh, was used, uh, there was a 7.2% higher survival at four years with this patient group. And when they propensity matched and adjusted for non confounding uh, factors, again, the inhaled anesthetic group had a lower overall survival compared to propofol. Now, Ishmael Dogana uh, in, uh, again looked uh, at uh, again propofol versus inhaled anesthetic maintenance uh, in colorectal cancer patients using the Danish uh, databases. This was quite a, a large retrospective analysis of having over 4,000 propensity match pairs in colorectal cancer surgery. And again, they found that with inhalational anesthetics was associated with an increased recurrence with a hazard, uh, hazard ratio of 1.12 that was significant. And Andrea Yap undertook the meta analysis as part of, a, of the uh, grant application for the Breakthrough Seed trial. Uh, again, and they found in this meta analysis that propofol fever had improved overall survival with a significant pooled hazard, hazard ratio of 0.76. So, the summary really is that no study to date has shown that propofol fever is associated with increased cancer recurrence. And really, the choice of anesthetic that we're using might be tripping a metastatic switch, switch especially in major cancer surgery. But really, we can't really change our clinical practice based on retrospective data alone. And that's why we need large clinical trials, like the Vapor C trial that we are conducting currently at Peter Mac. So, this is a multi center, multinational uh, trial, a randomized controlled uh, trial uh, with a two by two factorial design. We're aiming to recruit over 3,500 patients and uh, looking at uh, celofluorine maintenance and propofol maintenance with or without the use of intravenous uh, lignocaine. And now you might say, why are we talking about intravenous um, lignocaine or local anesthetic? Well, that's because we know that lignocaine has both direct and indirect effects on cancer uh, recurrence. So we know that the direct effects include inhibition of voltage gated sodium channels expressed on cancer cell types. Uh, the local anesthetics also promote tumor cell apoptosis and cause COX2 inhibition. But really, the main cancer signing mechanism is probably by inhibiting of this SIR kinase pathway that we spoke about earlier, which preserves our endothelium and prevents seeding of metastases into distant sites uh, during the time of surgery. 
that obviously uh, in terms of targeting uh, inflammation, we obviously have non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and we know that they exert both direct and indirect uh, anti-cancer effects um, and, uh, and, and effects on our immune system. Now, we know that with the breast cancer, there's actually a bimodal distribution on recurrence. So there's an early peak and a late peak, an early peak occurring at about 10 to 12 months, and a late peak occurring at about 36 to 48 months. But when patients were given intraoperative Cotorolax in this study by Bretsky, there was an almost complete uh, uh, obliteration of the early cancer recurrence seen uh, in, in, in these patients. Again, similar finding was with 4J. Uh, in, a, in a retrospective analysis, looking at conservative breast cancer surgery and giving them either an intraoperative ketorolac at 20 to 30 milligrams and doclofenac 75 milligrams, there was improved disease free survival and overall survival in these patient groups. Now, really, opioids is really the last piece of the puzzle in all this, and there's ongoing debate and controversy about the use of opioids uh, during, during, during surgery and not outside of, of cancer surgery. Um, so there are concerns from interest studies that opioids may inhibit natural killer cell cytotoxicity, but really these effects depends on the opioid receptor expressed by tumors, by non-opioid receptor mediated mechanisms of the opioids themselves, the dose given, the chronicity, and also the type of cancer. And Kata looked at this in a systematic review uh, a few years ago, and again, there was mixed findings in terms of uh, in lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and other cancers as well. So what we can say really about opioids is that the clinical evidence is sparse and conflicting and retrospective data though should suggest that maybe an opioid sparing technique may lead to a long-term better cancer outcomes. But really this should not be at the expense of worsening pain or promoting the adverse effects of pain and stress on cancer progression. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about riot. So uh, this is not the riot that we're gonna talk about. So we know really that the ultimate game of sur uh, goal of surgery is to return patients to at least their baseline functional status as soon as possible and with the least disability. Now, unfortunately, when patients get diagnosed with cancer, they'll seem unconscious and they'll have an unconsurgical treatment strategy that might involve new adjuvant therapies, surgery and anesthesia itself, then adjuvant therapies such as, you know, including things like a second operation uh, or radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And this can hopefully result in a remission or it can result, unfortunately, in recurrence. So RIOT is, stands for Return to Intended Oncological Therapy. It's a novel quality metric in oncology and really tries to assess the impact of the therapy period on the cancer journey. And it has really two components, uh, a binary one, a right race, so whether a patient does have their adjuvant therapies or not, and then a time to ride as a time taken to initiate their adjuvant therapies. And these are impacted by major uh, complications during or after surgery and also full functional recovery. But right really emphasizes uh, optimizing the patient's preoperative condition before undertaking surgery. So we can make sure that we can get the maximum benefit of the surgery, minimize the postoperative complications and also get the patients back on track. And we know things such as wound complications after breast cancer surgery and a stomach leak with colorectal cancer surgery and also cardiopulmonary complications following lung cancer surgery can all impact riot. Now, Bernadonna looked at this, uh, the impact of adjuvant chemotherapy on cancer outcomes in females with no positive breast cancer surgery. This was from an uh, impressive 20 year study, a uh, randomized controlled trial back in 1975. And they found that patients, uh, there was a 34% relative risk reduction in relapse with adjuvant chemotherapy that was started two to four weeks after surgery. And also there was a doubling of relapse free survival if these patients received at least 85% of their optimum chemotherapy dose. Neurobeliever also looked at, uh, 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 at the impact of delaying chemotherapy more than three months after surgery with early stage breast cancer. And that was associated with a really a doubling, almost doubling of the uh, likelihood of death from breast cancer itself. And Huang uh, looked at a delay in initiation of adjuvant radiotherapy for breast and head and neck cancer surgery. And again, there was a higher recurrence rate if there was a delay of more than four, eight weeks for breast cancer and more than six weeks of, of head and neck cancer uh, surgery. Now, a lawyer looked at the inability to riot in 250 patients having minimally invasive or open adjuvant liver resections from metastatic colorectal cancer. And 25% of, 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 of these patients in this study were unable to riot, but they were all actually in the open group. And the inability to riot was associated with a significantly shorter disease-free survival and overall survival in this patient group. And, and then Dane and Lawyer tried to assess, tried to then 
uh, implement a enhanced recovery program in liver surgery to see whether they can improve uh, riot rates from time to riot. And there was a, a signal towards an increase in the riot rate and a reduction in the time to riot with using an enhanced recovery program, but unfortunately it was non-significant. Uh, now this is, a, this is a, a, an important study by James Hayden and Anil Gupta and it showed how a simple uh, anesthetic intervention, so uh, in, instilling intraoperative local anesthetic of the gain 0.2% during the procedure and for 72 hours after the procedure uh, in cytoreductive ovarian cancer surgery resulted in a significant reduction in time to initiation of adjuvant chemotherapy from 29 days to 21 days uh, in this group. So how can we bring this all together? Where are we now? So we know that the perioperative space is quite complex and key interventions to, to influence outcomes are multi, uh, multimodal. It's really hard to show efficacy of any one intervention and no real formal guidelines exist in perioperative care of cancer patients. But what we should be aiming for is to shift our strategies towards interventions that may have positive effects from clinical evidence, such as TIVA and regional anesthesia, uh, and minimizing the use of interventions with positive and negative effects, such as volatiles and open surgery. And really to shift that balance towards positive effects on our immune system and inflammatory systems. And really, we know that these benefits seem to be greatest in more advanced cancers or cancers with a higher recurrence rate. So really what we need is an enhanced riot after surgery program uh, so we can really bring together all these preoperative medicine interventions to give the best chance for our patients to fight cancer. So what do we do at Peter Max? So preoperatively, we have a surgical school initiative where we educate patients about our, about our quality improvement initiatives. And we have a prehabilitation program to optimize our patients before surgery. And we provide them with a structured exercise programs based on the results of their cardiopulmonary exercise testing. We implement enhanced recovery after surgery program. We provide them nutritional and smoke and cessation support and give them iron infusions if they, are iron, they have iron deficiency anemia. And for high risk patients, we also provide them with an advanced care planning. Now, interoperatively, we give patients uh, so of pre med. We provide them with a coexity mouthwash to minimize post operative pulmonary complication. We run propofol of TIVA maintenance uh, using intravenous ligament cane and opioid sparing approach and uh, use robotic surgery, uh, normally invasive surgery where we can. And post-operatively, we implement our quality improvement initiatives that we uh, talked about briefly. And this is really, the aim is to reduce complications and to increase riot rate and reduce the time to riot. So this is just some of the quality improvement and medicine programs I'm involved in. This is the ACOF program, which is our pulmonary, uh, pulmonary optimization package. And uh, by using this program that includes active cycles of breathing technique, oral care, early mobilization, bed head elevation, we reduce our post operative pulmonary complications rates from 83% to 16% in high risk patient groups. This is our surgical school uh, program where we, uh, uh, and the components of the program, the educational components that we provide our patients during this meeting. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, we've had to change this to a webinar based uh, format where we can still provide patients with this education that they need. This is our CLOTS app, which is a, um, point of care bedside uh, decision support tool that we give to our staff um, that aims to minimize hematological complications in the postoperative VTEs and also providing uh, guidance about hematologic optimization and management antithrombotic drugs. And this is free for you to download off the Android stores or Google or, or Apple stores. Uh, this is our award winning STEP protocol, it stands for the Surgical Thromboembolism Prevention Protocol. And using this uh, protocol and implementing it actively over the last uh, five to seven years, we have reduced our post-operative uh, VTE rates uh, by from 3.1 to 0 0.6 per 1,000 surgical admissions. That's an 80% relative risk reduction. And also we've managed to re also reduce our post-operative bleeding rates by 32%. So really nothing but the best is good enough in the treatment of cancer. This is what um, Sir Peter McCann said in 1949 and holds true to this day. So thank you so much for listening. I hope that you gained something from this talk. This is the acknowledgement for the talks and I'll hopefully be around to take some questions at the end. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, uh, I first met Dr. Rita Kortbawi a few years ago when she was newly coming to Lebanon from France. Uh, at the time, I was the uh, president of the Lebanese Society for Pain Treatment, and she was very enthusiastic to join the society. And I was really impressed by her will 
to, to, to have a positive impact on pain practice in Lebanon. Unfortunately, uh, the, the situation, the new crisis has obligated, uh, pushed Dr. Cordobawi to relocate to France. But uh, she never lost her roots, so, so she's with us today. Dr. Cordobawi is graduated from Paris Descartes University in Anesthesiology and Critical Care in 2016. She has a master's degree in pain management and has been working in developing a pain-free culture and interventional pain management techniques for cancer patients. She joined LAUMC Medical Hospital in 2018 as a pain management specialist. Then she relocated to France in 2020. She joined the Gustave Roussy Cancer Center and is currently the acting chief of the pain management unit. Uh, it was a pleasure to hear Dr. Kurt Bowie talking about simple blocks for pain management. Uh, Dr. Kurt Bowie, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Hisham, for your uh, kind introduction. Can you hear me well? Okay, perfect. So this uh, presentation is entitled Simple Blocks for Pain Management. It is simple as the blocks will be uh, quite easy to learn, easy to perform, but yet uh, we should not forget about the safety guidelines when using uh, local anesthetics and of course uh, the, the correct anatomy of uh, the region of interest. So uh, we'll be, I'll be going through four uh, kinds of uh, different uh, clinical situations, mainly the postural puncture headache with the spinopalatine ganglion block, painful knee conditions, chronic abdominal pain, and mirage mira aesthetica. Uh, the outline will more or less be the same for the four uh, situations, with the first a clinical presentation, then the anatomy of the nerve or the structure, and then the way we do uh, the block for this, uh, for this condition. So I'm starting with the postural puncture headache. So there is current evidence that uh, the postural puncture headache is now uh, quite frequently of non-anesthesia origin, because, for example, in cancer patients, most of the lumbar punctures are done by non-anesthesiologists, and the incidence of postural puncture headache is around 10% in these cases, either for diagnostic or therapeutic purposes. Um, in the obstetric patients, it's still around 1.5 or 1.7 percent. So the presentation is uh, mainly uh, quite uh, an important um, uh, headache, frontal and occipital headache, and these symptoms can be sometimes quite debilitating. Uh, the first line is, of course, medical, uh, medical treatment, but when it fails, the gold standard for treatment at, uh, uh, for now is the uh, epidural blood patch, which is quite an invasive technique, and sometimes it uh, could be, uh, there could also be, uh, uh, it could be impossible to do, especially, for example, in cancer patients when they have low platelets, or, for example, in our patients when we put an intrathecal catheter and then we don't want to do an epidural blood patch, but blood patch to avoid the puncture of the catheter. So what are our alternatives? The spinocalatine uh, ganglion block, actually, among first to, uh, to, to present this spinopalatine ganglion, it is uh, present at the end of, uh, in the posterior uh, nasopharynx, it's actually covered by a mucous membrane, and it's a nerve structure that um, that, uh, that, that, that accumulates parasympathetic and sympathetic fibers from the cranial nerve 7 and from the cranial nerve 5. Um, so it's quite a superficial structure at the uh, posterior level of uh, the nasopharynx. Uh, so this is how we do a spinopalatine ganglion block. Actually, it's uh, now we've been seeing this image quite frequently now with the COVID outbreak. So it's more or less like a deeper PCR, but previously, the cotton tip was soaked in lidocaine 2%. So the patient is in a supine position, the head is hyperextended, and the idea is to introduce the uh, cotton tip soaked lidocaine uh, until the uh, posterior pharynx and then leave it in place for around 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, the, the side effects are quite rare, mainly it irritates from the anesthesia and of course epistaxis from local trauma uh, and the, the sensation of numbness in the posterior pharynx, they are usually uh, quite transient. Uh, 
Uh, it's quite interesting to see that uh, in these patients, uh, um, we'll be looking at the blue dots first, at the uh, blue plots first. Uh, in these patients, the, the, the scores, uh, the uh, pain scores before the uh, block are quite high, around 7 and uh, 8 over 10 um, uh, pain scores. And 30 minutes after the block, there is a decrease of uh, four points uh, of, of, um, on the VES pain scores. So it's quite interesting to see that it's um, very easy to, to, to perform, but also uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the resolution of the pain is also quite fast. Now, in a retros retrospective study comparing the spinopalatine ganglion block and the epidural blood patch, we found that there is a significant pain relief in both situations, yet the onset of pain relief is much faster with the spinopalatine uh, uh, ganglion block. There are no significant difference in headache relief at one, two, and seven days. So it's quite an interesting uh, alternative to the epidural blood patch. Now, what I want to show you actually, I want to go back to this uh, recent study that is a randomized blinded uh, trial that compared the youth with a cotton tip that was not soaked into like the cayenne. And as you can see, the results actually are quite interesting, even in the placebo group. So most probably what happens during the spinopalatine ganglion block is uh, that the Impression on the, the uh, structure itself might help regulating the regional blood flow, this river vascular tone. So we still don't really understand how it works. It might not be associated to, to the action of the local anesthetic itself. It might be enough to uh, ensure uh, to ensure uh, pain relief. So that would be quite interesting to 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 uh, to understand in the coming years. So this procedure is technically simple, as you, as you saw. It's easy to replicate, it's safe, minimally invasive, and it must be considered in patients where there is a contraindication to the epidural blood patch, but also when it's interesting to delay the epidural blood patch, there are studies that uh, showed that the timing of uh, the epidural blood flash had uh, effects on the effectiveness of, uh, of the EPV. So maybe it's interesting sometimes to do a spinopalatine uh, ganglion block to delay uh, the, the EPV or uh, at least to do only one and not to have to repeat it later on. Now, the second, uh, the second um, painful condition is uh, knee, knee painful conditions that are quite frequent. Osteoarthritis has a high incidence, around 10% in men, 13% in women. Uh, the treatment can be quite challenging. And recent data has shown the importance or the, uh, there is quite an interesting use of the genicular nerve blocks in osteoarthritis, but also in the ER for knee pain uh, related to fracture and in rheumatoid arthritis. And very recent randomized clinical trials in rheumatology showed that the genicular nerve block uh, was add, um, uh, could do uh, even better than intraarticular steroid injections as uh, the effects could persist longer. So um, this is the innervation of uh, a knee. There are four genicular nerve blocks, the superior, the superior medial genicular uh, nerve, the superolateral genicular nerve, the inferolateral genicular nerve, and the inferior medial genicular nerve. This is quite an interesting block because it's motor sparing block. So it's only a sensory uh, block. Uh, so there are four nerves, but we will only do three injections because as you can see here, the inferolateral genicular nerve is very close to the recurrent papillary nerve. So if we do an injection on this side, there is a risk of foot drop by, uh, by uh, anesthetizing the uh, CPN that is very close to the inferolateral genicular nerve. So how do we do this block? Actually, what we do is that we uh, put the uh, ultrasound probe parallel to the tibia or to the femoral uh, shaft, and then we look for the vessels. So sometimes the nerve cannot be seen, but each of these genicular nerves travel along a vein and an artery. So what we usually do is that we go in plane or out of plane perpendicular to the uh, ultrasound probe until the, the bony contact, and uh, then we inject 5 milliliters per nerve close to the vessels.
the risks of the this uh, block is of course the food drop uh, as i explained earlier a vascular puncture or intraarticular puncture um, should we use steroids in these genicular nerve blocks or not um, the addition of a steroid can improve the analgesic effect and the function over the short term yet it didn't have a clinical benefit uh, from um, compared to local anesthetic alone. So it's not sh we're not really sure that we need to add steroids to these genicular nerve blocks. Now, what's interesting with these blocks, even when they are done with the uh, rokivacaine, for example, they would last more than the lasting effects of the local anesthetic itself. So, for example, it might last for over than 10 days with uh, rokivacaine. It can be repeated. And uh, usually with the repetition of the blocks, the need for a block becomes, uh, becomes less frequent. And if this is not enough, then the patient can be addressed for radiofrequency, a pulse radiofrequency treatment. So oh, it's quite interesting because a motor sparing technique, uh, there are more and uh, more studies about using the genicular nerve block for the surgery, for the knee surgery. Uh, yet it's yet to be confirmed. The anatomical lung marks are quite easy. You should pay attention. There are only three injections. It controls pains, but it also improves function and it's quite a safe procedure. Now, the two following uh, clinical presentations are uh, due to nerve entrapments. So uh, I will be uh, talking about the anterior cutaneous nerve entrapment syndrome, but also about myalgia paresthetica. So both of them are usually due to a micro repetitive trauma over the nerve when they pass through a fibrous uh, channel. And uh, so these, uh, both of these, uh, these conditions are underdiagnosed and undertreated. We've been seeing a lot of uh, anterior penis nerve entrapment syndrome in the department, most probably because these patients, they uh, have severe refractory pain. They come very often to the uh, emergency department and there is uh, all of the laboratory testing and their imaging studies are normal. So it's, it's quite uh, complicated to, to treat, the, to treat them, yet the patients keep on coming back with, uh, with, uh, with uh, very severe pain. So these nerves, we'll be looking at the anatomy first so we can understand the clinical presentation of uh, acnes. So the, um, the, uh, the intercostal branches between T6 and T11, they pass through the transverse and uh, abdominal, uh, abdominal muscle and the internal oblique muscle. And then when they travel, to uh, the front of the abdomen, they pass through a very, uh, they, they do a U-turn and they pass through a fibrous ring channel. Some authors suggest that the nerve entrapment occurs at this level, but also the muscle contraction at this level usually causes ischemia of uh, the nerve and the severe pain that is related to it. So when you see this point, uh, you will understand that the pain presentation in these patients is usually, uh, there is usually a trigger point that is next to the lateral board of the rectus abdominis muscle. It is an ipsilateral uh, pain on uh, the one side of the abdomen. Um, so uh, it's a unilateral pain. You should find the trigger point. There is also a positive carnet sign. I'll show you what is a positive carnet sign. And a very important element, the, the laboratory findings are normal, the imaging are negative. And usually the, the block, the, the, the local anesthesia injection serves both as a diagnostic and a therapeutic uh, block. So carnet sign is quite an interesting sign because it allows us to differentiate between the vis visceral pain and the uh, parietal pain. So uh, pariet parietal abdominal uh, pains are not very well known. And what we can do actually is put, the examiner puts uh, his finger on the point of maximal tenderness over the abdominal wall. And then he asks the patient to either lift the head or lift the legs, and this will increase, uh, will increase the pain. So if the pain is increased, then we know that the source is more likely the abdominal wall. If there is no increase in pain, that the source is likely the, the cervix. Now, um, 
for the clinical presentation, so as you can see here, there's really one single trouble point that we can identify in the, in the image A. In figure B, when we test for the uh, sensitivity of the, uh, the abdomen, there is a decreased sensitivity on, uh, uh, on the level of the entrapment. And in figure D, you see the pinch test. Actually, when we pinch the skin over the area of the entrapment, this will cause uh, um, this will cause uh, uh, an increase in the level of uh, pain for the patients. So once we have all these, these elements, we were more or less sure our patient has uh, an acne. And what we can do is either a local anesthetic uh, injection, a trigger point injection, uh, or we can uh, do an ultrasound uh, guided injection. So you can do this without the ultrasound, yet for our patients who are usually, uh, they have muscle wasting, they have uh, malnutrition, we prefer to use the ultrasound because the, the uh, usually uh, the level of the injection is 0 0.5 to 1 centimeter below, uh, below the skin, so it's really very close to the skin. Um, so there are two different ways of doing this injection. Either you can find the area of entry of the nerve in the rectus abdominis, you will find it around 0.5 centimeter to one centimeter medial to the linea semilunaris, or you cannot find it. And then you just do like on the picture shown here, a block inside the rectus sheath. You inject five milliliters of local anesthetic on the level of uh, the vein, and usually it's enough to, uh, to, uh, to decrease the patient's pain. So the presently available management strategies are mainly to report injection ultrasound guided blocks. It is possible to do a surgical neurectomy, chemical neurolysis if uh, the blocks are not enough, but it's important to note that these blocks can be repeated and that steroid use can also uh, increase uh, the, the, the effects of the block. And finally, I'll be going through medagia peristetica. So medagia peristetica is also an entrapment pain syndrome of the lateral femoral tennis nerve of the thigh when it passes through the uh, inguinal ligament. Um, medagia peristetica is uh, quite, uh, well, it's quite a common, uh, common uh, pain condition. Pain is usually localized to the sides of the, side, the thigh, lateral side of the thigh, sometimes on the anterior uh, part of the thigh, and it has a uh, it's, uh, it's uh, not very extended, so it's like a tennis uh, racket uh, surface. Um, in cancer patients, Meridia peristetica is quite alarming because actually it can be associated with the, uh, the appearance of, uh, of, a, of a pelvic tumor or of a lymph node invasion. So when we're following up a patient for, for example, a gynecologic cancer, the the appearance of the medangia peristetica uh, should lead us to do an imaging quite fast to understand, uh, to understand uh, the appearance of this, uh, the, the new onset of this type of pain. If not, it's a condition that we can see quite frequently in obese patients or in diabetic patients. Most of the patients respond to conservative management and uh, nerve block. So uh, this is the anatomy of the lateral femoral tennis nerve. So as you can see, it rises from the L2 L3 lumbar roots. And most importantly, it's very close to the lymph nodes. So uh, if we have a tumoral invasion of the lymph nodes, then, uh, then, uh, then we, uh, we will see an expression of melangia peristetica in the patients. So the lateral femoral tennis nerve most of the time in more than 80 percent of the patients it passes under the inguinal ligament and uh, so to find it we have to place the probe uh, medially and inferiorly to the antero uh, to the anterior superior uh, iliac spine and uh, then we will see it laying above the uh, sartorius muscle so i'll show you uh, an ultrasound picture. We have the sartorius muscle, the tensure of the fascia lata muscle, and uh, the, 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 the small uh, structure here that is the uh, LFCN. Sometimes we don't see it and we usually inject above the sartorius. Uh, so uh, thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you, Rita, for this clear uh, 
presentation for those simple, really simple blocks that can be done without uh, big training. Uh, we can uh, pass to the questions. Is there any questions for the three, three speakers in the audience? Uh, uh, Dr. Ortbawi, uh, regarding the um, sphenopalatine uh, block, uh, how frequently you do it? <clears throat> and is there any, any prospective study comparing it to epidural blood patch? Because if it's superior, really superior, it's not the, we don't need to do any more this invasive technique of blood patch. Because as you said, uh, this block have a long lasting result. Uh, uh, to your knowledge, is there any prospective study concerning this uh, pro uh, this problem? I, I think it, no, I don't know. I think it's gonna uh, it's gonna be done, but it's complicated to do a blind study con uh, concerning this. Uh, so it will be it might be randomized, but it's complicated to have a blind evaluation of uh, the effect of these uh, two techniques. Uh, I think what it's important to know that we can use it much more easily than an epidural blood patch. I think that we should use it more uh, frequently, especially, uh, for example, in obstetric uh, settings where the patients can be uh, very well uh, altered and the newly, uh, the new moms can be very affected by these, uh, these, uh, these headaches and in our cancer patients, actually epidural blood batch were not an option. So we weren't really, it was really complicated to do these, uh, these blood batches. So I think there will be uh, an important part uh, of these headaches that will be treated by the spenopalatine ganglion block. And, but there, in some situation, we must probably still need to do an epidural blood batch. Blood batch. Okay. And what concentration of xylocaine you use? Two percent. Two percent. Okay. Uh. The, the interesting questions would be: Should we do a unilateral or bilateral sphenopalatine block, for example? Now, this is this is not uh, well uh, understood for now. Whether sh we should use an anesthetic or not? Uh, as as you saw, the, the the compression over the ganglion was enough to, to treat the pain. So this would be interesting. Uh, uh, interesting topics to, to study uh, to study further. Okay. There's a question. Uh, good morning for uh, Dr. Uzbawi. Concerning the uh, post-puncture headache block, is there any difference between doing performing a greater occipital nerve block and a sphenopalatine concerning the management of a post-puncture headache disease? So there are a few studies now about uh, uh, using both of uh, both of the techniques together to uh, to to gain uh, to gain in uh, to gain in uh, pain uh, efficacy in pain treatment uh, the the greater occipital nerve block needs a little bit more training than uh, the spinopalatine block uh, actually, what's really interesting in this block, it's, it's really very simple to do. The patient doesn't even have to be in, a, uh, in the Baku setting. And uh, more and more patients, uh, more and more doctors in the US train patients, for example, for chronic headaches to do these standard blocks alone at home when they have a, a migraine crisis. So uh, I think uh, there, there are studies going on now to show the association of both types of blocks. But what's important to note is really the, the, the simple uh, way of doing uh, this blog with quite an interesting result on uh, pain afterwards. Uh, regarding genicular nerve block, uh, how do you explain the lasting result? I couldn't find an answer for it actually, and uh, it's just uh, um, something that's quite frequent in the studies and something that we've been, we've noted on our patients. Uh, sometimes when you do a block with lidocaine, uh, just a diagnostic block with lidocaine, it might uh, last for several days, and sometimes with rupivacaine it could last up to 10 days. But we, we really, I don't have an explanation for it, and I couldn't find the one, so I don't know. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Okay. 
So we, after Avera, we conclude the session. Concerning the genicular block, uh, is there any place for radio frequency ablation? And this, uh, it was adopted uh, a few years ago. Is it still a technique uh, useful or more uh, lasting uh, result uh, comparing to uh, uh, lagnacaine uh, injection? Yeah, so uh, now there are, uh, I, I don't know if you're talking about the thermal or the pulsed radio frequency. So the thermal radio frequency was associated with uh, sometimes the uh pain uh, after the, the, uh, the procedure. So now we're more and more people are using pulsed radio frequency. And pulsed radio frequency, the nerve is heated to 40, 42 degrees. So the, the proteins are denaturated, but they're not completely um, the nerve is not completely damaged, and usually it's associated with the recurrence of the pain uh, after a few months. So, uh, so it still has uh, it's, it still has its um, its place. For example, in osteoarthritis, when the patients cannot benefit from a new replacement surgery because of uh, many comorbidities, uh, so sometimes uh, doing the block alone or uh, repeating the block alone is not enough. If uh, the recurrence of the pain is very fast, usually uh, we address for uh, There is a question. Uh, hi, thank you for the very useful lectures. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Rita and Dr. Rita. Uh, how do you assess uh, the pain in cancer patients, especially that these patients have psychological issues or uh, they are dealing with grieving or denial, how can you be so accurate in diagnosing, diagnosing the, the pain in those patients? Um, well, it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> It's a sub-specialization of many years, and it's also a pain consultation of at least one hour every time. So uh, and then we, we, have, we, we work in close relationship with the, with the psychology department. So we have a group of psychologists who are specialized in oncology patients and taking care of patients who are, uh, who are dealing with cancer. And uh, but there's still we, we still have cl clinical pain conditions that are quite well defined with the uh, like nerve entrapments, et cetera. But treating cancer patients is complicated as treat treating chronic pain patients usually have, uh, this is why we use the biopsychosocial model for treating the patients when we really take care of the disease itself, but also all the psychological part and uh, the social part, et cetera. So uh, it's quite a multidisciplinary uh, management with patients. And exactly, as Rita said, when we have complicated patients that we meet as a preoperative consultation of anesthesia, we refer them to specialists, to pain specialists, in order to have a good pain management uh, plan for the post-operative part. And they are followed up uh, preoperatively, and then there's a consultation in the post immediate post-operative and at long term. I think it's important to realize as well that pain management preoperatively also helps patients prehabilitate before their surgery and improve their physiological reserve before surgery. If they have significant pain, then they can't actually do the exercises that we often prescribe to them before surgery that might actually improve their or minimize their post-operative complications. So pain management and referring it to pain specialists before surgery is quite a key component and having a proper plan around the time of surgery as well about the pain management in terms of regional approaches and you know uh, systemic approaches. For Rita Jawish, Rita, do you use OFA in your practice? There are some, some of us anesthesiologists that use OFA, not all of us. Um, there, are, there was a study also at Gustave Roussy that was really very promising about this, but there's no, um, we are, it's not a protocol in the institution. 
for me personally, I, I, I still uh, use uh, opioids. But uh, yes, it's, uh, it's common. We can. I have a question for Dr. Shahal. Uh, as you know, uh, people now uh, search on Google. So we meet too many people having a phobia to use cancer patient having phobia to get opioids for uh, pain management. And uh, so they refuse. How do you deal with these patients? How do you manage? Well, the question really is that, um, I mean, there's no evidence actually using opioids in a non-surgical setting has, has any negative impacts. So actually, if anything, it might have positive impacts. So, so the, the opioid question is really only around the time of surgery and its impact on that natural killer cell cytotoxicity, which might give cancer a chance to spread by having causing a bit of this immunosuppression and uh, modulating our kind of innate immune system. So the opioids in cancer in a non-surgical setting is not an issue at all. It's only, we're only talking about this when somebody is having surgery that will kind of might open up a window of this having that kind of signaling pathway activation or inflammation and, and, uh, and immunosuppression where cancer might spread at the time of surgery. So opioids are definitely uh, still first line management for uh, general pain in non-surgical settings. And even in the surgical setting, again, like I said, the, the evidence is still that, you know, you'd rather have an opioid on board with good pain relief than not to have an opioid on board and somebody with severe pain. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question to Dr. Rani. Uh, regarding the differences in uh, the long-term effects of anesthetics we are using on the recurrence of cancer. So at your unit, do you have a solid base protocol that are you, you are using for your patients for anesthesia? Solid pain protocol, is that what you asked? Yeah, yeah. For, for the anesthesia okay. protocol, you are using for anesthetics. What is your protocol for the moment? So we, we obviously use multimodal approach. Um, we use now a lot of neuraxial, uh, so intrathecal morphine. Um, obviously epidural as well, but intrathecal morphine is, in our practice now, we use it quite a lot. Uh, so, so, you know, small doses between anywhere from 200 or sometimes up to 500 mics to 1,000 mics if we are doing a massive pelvic desenteration. Um, so we still try to minimize opioids, but we use a lot of intravenous lignocaine. Again, like I said, we use a lot of, um, you know, obviously coxine inhibition. We tend to use opioids that have some evidence that are, they're not as immunosuppressive, like remifentanil, tramadol, are not as immunosuppressive as morphine. Uh, but like I said, again, that's kind of controversial. But really the aim really is to provide really a multimodal approach for these patients using regional technique where we can. Uh, but for, for us, yeah, using neur neuraxial approach for kind of major, major cavity surgery is still kind of the you know, first line management. And then, yeah, we still provide them, obviously, with kind of PCAs for their major surgeries afterwards. But if we have intrathecal morphine normally in the first 24 hours, they're usually pretty, pretty okay. Thank you. There's a question in the audience. My question is uh, for Dr. Shahar. Uh, is there any difference really uh, between starting pain management preoperatively and before the insult? Then starting um, it after, for example, <laughs> epidural before the surgery and uh, or, or versus uh, PCA morphine post-op. So in terms of preemptive analgesia, um, yes. So we do provide patients with kind of on the, on the morning of the surgery, we give them some oral paracetamol. We give them a COX-2 inhibitor. We used to give them a lot of pregabalin as well. Um, so uh, gabapentinoids, but uh, we've had a lot of issues with uh, significant sedation after the procedure. So that's kind of fallen away a bit. It was quite a, quite a fad that a year ago, a few years ago, where everybody was getting 75 uh, milligrams of pregabalin. Uh, some of our liver patients actually didn't wake up uh, after having pregabalin um, because they were so sedated. Uh, but yeah, in terms of preemptive analgesia, that's all, it's always important. Obviously, we, we, we put our blocks before patients are asleep. Uh, but in terms of do we have a formal approach to starting analgesia earlier, like I said, obviously, apart from you know, including our uh, pain specialists, uh, referring them to our uh, chronic pain team who can then optimize the analgesia prior to surgery. You know, Obviously, use a multimodal approach, anything from opioids to clonidine to 
you know, uh, you know, other modalities as well. Um, um, so yeah, it's it's obviously preemptive analgesia it does help, um, and it also it, it might be a cost saving measure as well. So you know, oral paracetamol doesn't cost anything compared to like IV paracetamol or oral sercoxib is much 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 cheaper than IV paracoxib. Um, so there, there, there's that aspect as well. But uh, in the end, yeah, obviously providing things at the start is always good. But in the end, it's really about the whole approach uh, from the pre-admission clinic all the way through the pre-hibitation program.